leisure part. Um, and then do lab, which is three-part dissection. And then come back and start physiology, okay? Uh, looking at the autonomic nerve and how the supply and how the cells um, undergo contraction on their own without nerve stimulus. So I looked for a couple of videos um, that kind of show blood flow here before we move on to circulation itself. And pay attention to uh, the valve. There's a bunch of them out there. Some of them are more schematic than others. And we'll be looking at this again on Thursday when we look at Thursday, Thursday. Either tomorrow or Tuesday when we look at cardiac cycle. So I like this one because it looks more realistic, but it still shows the blue and red for the oxygenated and oxygenated blood. So notice that both atria fill with blood at the same time. So we have a kind of pattern where the heart is at rest, blood is flowing into both right atria and left atria. Remember, this is systemic deoxygenated blood. This is pulmonary circulation, oxygenated blood. All right, And then we have the ventricle now contracting and going out the uh, pulmonary trunk and the aorta at the same time. So we're going to be reviewing this as part of the cardiac cycle and then looking at each step about what opens and what closes the valve. This is showing the conduction pathway of the electrical signals through the heart tissue. And then we'll start talking about that on Tuesday, I believe. There's a couple of good videos out there about that, but you can, again, distinguish the valves. So both sets of valves are opening and closing as a set together, all right? So atrial ventricular valves open and close together, semi-motor valves open and close together. <coughs> so I didn't stop to talk about it, um, but this is the pattern that we were looking at just now. So here's the right and left atria. Pressure is greater in the atria than it is in the ventricles because the heart's at rest. So there's no electrical um, flow through the cardiac muscle cells, the contractile cells. And that higher pressure pushes, keeps the valves open. Okay. At the, um, then they contract. But at the same time that that is being pushed open and while it's filling, we have the semilunar valves. The semilunar valves are closed while the atrial ventricular valves are open. And what's keeping the semi-motor valves closed is the back flow, if you will. There's no force pushing blood out of the ventricles. And so that lack of force going out, the weight or the gravity of the hydrostatic pressure itself of the back flow fills those three little uh, cusps and keeps them closed. Then the ventricles contract. And that pushes blood up behind the valve leaflets and closes the atrial ventricular valves. So now for a period of time, again we'll go over this on uh, tomorrow on Tuesday, for a period of time, both sets of valves are closed. The atrial ventricular valves are closed and the semilunar valves are closed. But the heart's contract. So you have a closed system, same volume of blood, not changing, but the space is getting smaller. So that spikes blood pressure very rapidly within the ventricles. And that pressure then is what the corneal tendony and the pathway muscles are resisting. Remember, it's not the muscle contraction of these muscles that forces the valves close. It's again the pressure, an increase in blood pressure behind them. Finally, that pressure overcomes the resistance of the blood on the opposite side of the semilunar valve. And blood is ejected from the ventricles into either the pulmonary trunk or the aorta. So you'll notice as these valves open, remember right here on either side, um, we have the openings for the coronary arteries. So as these valves open, they are going to be blocking the openings for the coronary arteries. And you can see that in the sheep heart dissection today. You can see the openings for those coronary arteries. So now when these valves are open, the atrial ventricular valves are closed because we don't want blood going back into the atrium. We want it going out of the heart. 
and then the heart relaxes as blood vessel as blood pressure here drops, blood flow comes back and closes these valves. So we have a short period of time when both valves are closed again, but pressure is dropping rather than rising. And eventually as pressure drops, all this time blood is continuing to flow into the atria while the heart is contracting. Um, blood's continuing to flow into the atria and building up in volume. And then as the ventricles relax, that's enough change in pressure to open the valves again. So that's the cardiac cycle that we're going to look at um, on Tuesday after we've discussed the electrical current through the heart that's responsible for that. Now let's look at the blood flow to the heart in the coronary blood supply. Anybody have the pages already? It's 24. 24. Okay. Somebody tried to come off this hours yesterday. I forgot to call in. I was home with a, a migraine and I forgot to call. So I'm on Excedrin right now, so if I chatter away, my daughter's laughing at me this morning. I'm on girls. <laughs> show you the uh, radial artery in the forearm, you don't have to say it's the right radial artery. Okay? But when we deal with the heart, I do want you to do that. <clears throat> it has two branches. One branch comes down the inferior border and is short. And then finally, the last branch is the terminal branch off of the end of the right coronary artery. The right coronary artery is this entire structure here. And then we have the marginal artery. There's lots of marginal arteries. There are several marginal arteries in the heart, but we're only looking at one. 
Okay. So if you're looking at netters, there will be a whole bunch of blood vessels marked on their diagrams. This is the only marginal artery that you're required to know. The other branch here is the posterior. Interventricular, not intra, but inter, because it's between the right and left ventricles on the back, artery. Okay. So coronary artery with two branches. Right coronary artery. Then we have the left coronary artery with two branches. So that's why you're dry diagramming that. Let me place it over here. surface of the heart, again between the right and left ventricles, and so this is known as the anterior interventricular arteries. <clears throat> if you're looking at angiograms, that's when a dyed material is introduced into the blood, and then they take pictures of it as it flows through <clears throat> various organs and for the heart through these vessels. And you look at an x-ray um, angiogram, it's not called the anterior interventricular artery. It's called the, anterior, the coronary um, anterior descending. So I'm not even going to go there, okay, I'm just warning you that if you see images of angiograms of the heart, different terms are used. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the law. Um, these two branches are almost the same size. The other one matches uh, kind of the right coronary artery. So it's going to go around the back of the heart. The right coronary artery going around the right side of the heart and the circumflex artery going around the left kind of form a belt around the waist of the heart between atria and ventricle. So this is identified as a circumflex artery. right here, and then this would be the posterior interventricular, again, between the right and the left ventricles in the back. And then right here along the side is the marginal artery. So as we sit in line like this, it runs along the inferior border or margin of the heart. And I'll give you some, which of these three it is, I'll give you some clues on how to find that when we do the veins. Then we have the left coronary artery, and again, it's behind the pulmonary trunk. So you're only seeing about three quarters of an inch of it right here. It's really only about an inch and a half long anyway. Then it comes down in the front between the right ventricle and left ventricle as the anterior interventricular artery. And the circumflex runs in that groove around the back. So two arteries, two branches of each artery. Now let me diagram it on the board, on the heart itself. <clears throat> and I guess I would need to have an aorta for it to come off of. 
will have a pulmonary trunk. Okay, it's here, right coronary artery, marginal artery, right coronary artery ends, gets off posterior individual. to give rise to the anterior interventricular artery and circumflex. Posterior view. Right coronary artery. Circumflexor. And again, it's not, it seems confusing at first when you look at the heart with all these reds and blues on them, but if you look for the pattern first, understand the pattern, and then look on the heart, you'll find that pattern pretty easily. Now one thing I want to point out before we move to the venous drainage is that here they show this anastomosis, it really isn't one. Okay, now anastomosis is when two vessels are connected together by a series of smaller vessels. So that if there was a blockage in this coronary artery right here, or the anterior interventricular artery, blood flow, and so it's coming down here, it's not going to be able to get to the tissue down here. With an anastomosis, the way they show this, 
blood flow could come off the right coronary artery through the posterior interventricular and come up back this direction and supply that area with tissue. We see that type of anastomosis at every major joint. So there are seven arteries that come off to the shoulder area, some above, some posterior to the shoulder, and they wrap around and form this type of anastomosis so that you can have a block of the, break, the axillary artery about the size of my finger, anterior or proximal, and blood flow coming up here, coming around the back of the shoulder, can still make its way into the um, axillary artery and continue down the arm. As important as the heart is, that it continue to receive an oxygenated blood supply, it doesn't have those anastomoses. I don't know why they drew them on here. So exercise, um, doing cardiovascular work, increases the number of small branches, all right? So that if there is a blockage here, there's branches proximal to that and from another vessel that could come around and supply that tissue. But there isn't that true anastomosis where they're actually connected to each other. Um, in fact, one of, some of, one of the treatments after a heart attack um, to gain those additional vessels is to actually go in with a laser and burn holes in the myocardium as kind of a scaffolding for blood flow to come in and uh, provide our, our blood supply to that tissue. All right, so two coronary arteries, two branches of each. So on this view, there would be the left coronary artery immediately, practically dividing into anterior interventricular and circumflex. And then here would be the circumflex coming around. This is another marginal artery off the left coronary, but we're not at that one. Okay. Now let's look at the venous drainage. So these blood vessels, similar to where we learned the blood supply to the brain, and blood vessels surround the arteries around the base of the brain and go through the skull side go down into the brain tissue, form capillaries and the veins and come back to the surface of the brain to leave um, as the jugular vein and vertebral veins. So smaller arteries are branching off of these, going deep into myocardial tissue, forming arterioles and capillaries, and then reforming venules and veins and bringing those veins to the surface. All, there are three major cardiac veins, all right? So we have coronary arteries, but cardiac veins. So there are three major cardiac veins, and you can see all three of them right here on this posterior view. I'll go back to the anterior view to, to diagram them, and I'm going to erase the board and um, just put the veins up. Oh, no, I won't. I'll leave it with that so you can associate them with the arteries. The great cardiac vein starts in the front, comes around to the back, and it is the one that dilates to form the coronary sinus that we talked about on Tuesday that empties into the right atrium just near the inferior vena cava. We looked on the inside, that was one of the three vessels we talked about that transported venous blood to the right atrium. So this is our inferior vena cava here. So great cardiac vein forms the coronary sinus and then small cardiac vein and middle cardiac vein drain into it just prior to its passing into the atrial wall. Okay. So I'll leave the diagrams up, but I want to erase the arterial label, so if there's any of you that still want to take pictures of that, I'll leave the drawing, but I want to erase the name so I have room to write the venous component. Okay. 
So I'm going to draw this in blue because this is deoxygenated lead. And we'll start with the anterior surface. So here's the pattern. Great cardiac vein, small cardiac vein, and middle cardiac vein. After I diagram that on the board, I will write a list it's in your lecture notes already about what veins are associated with what arteries. So you'll see them together. So we start with the great cardiac vein, and it's going to be starts with the anterior interventricular and then it travels with the circumflex and becomes dilated to form the coronary sinus. So we have I want to put it here. So we've got that solid. by the way, will not be visible on the sheep heart because the visceral serous pericardium or epicardium is covered with adipose tissue. That will be the great cardiac vein. And then this dilated component is the coronary sinus. Okay. You may also see the terms um, posterior interventricular, sorry, anterior interventricular vein has the same name as the artery. You're welcome to use that, but on the back, it doesn't apply. So it's fine to have anterior interventricular vein here, but then when you get part of it on the back, it's no longer anterior, and so the name just doesn't fit for me. So that's why I prefer great cardiac. But again, you may see that term. Then we have the small cardiac vein. And this is the one that forms a structure that helps you identify the marginal artery. So the small cardiac vein is going to travel with the marginal artery. And then it's going to travel with the right coronary artery. So it's going to come around like this. with the, or the 
middle cardiac vein also entering into the coronary sinus. Let me write that list on the board. From the perspective of the veins. Actually, let me do that in color so it stands out more. <coughs> Sandy leaving us. Insanity or sanity? sanity? There you go. We've gone so crazy that we're getting our sanity back. Yeah. <laughs> we got the wow. circle. Thank you. 
So we're going to stop there with lecture. And I mean, I'm still going to lecture later on today, but I wanted to give you lab time and um, the sheet part dissection, and then we'll take the quiz on the coronary structures. Okay. So I took out questions on the coronary blood supply since we hadn't done that on Tuesday yet. So the quiz will cover, as I told you on Tuesday, just the material on the lab sheet down to um, ligaments of arteriosum, but not including blood supply. Now, I talked about ligaments of arteriosum in lab. A couple people had asked about it, but I hadn't mentioned it in lecture. So let me go back to that structure. Here we go. So back to components. This is an anterior view. You can't see much of the left atrium. You just see the left oracle. Pulmonary trunk arises out of the right ventricle. In fact, part of the right ventricle forms the anterior surface of the pulmonary trunk to the embryology development that we looked at on Tuesday. And then that divides into left and right pulmonary arteries. The aorta comes out the center of the heart and curves over the right pulmonary artery as it goes down to the back of the heart. So we talked about uh, fetal circulation. As blood comes in the inferior vena cava, it's carrying oxygenated blood from the mother via the umbilical vein. And it's carrying deoxygenated blood from the baby, so it's kind of fixed, but it's as oxygenated as it's going to get. And as it comes out here, it comes at an angle and shoots into the foramen ovale. All right? And then that's going to go into the left atrium and get pumped to the body, delivering oxygenated blood to the fetus's body without needing to go to the lungs, because obviously there's no oxygen being picked up in the baby's lungs. The rest of that, along with what's coming from the superior vena cava, the head, and the chest, walls, and the upper extremities, is going to go into the right ventricle and get pumped out the pulmonary trunk to the lungs. And remember, the lungs are under, are filled with fluid. So there's a great resistance to the blood flowing through there, more resistance than there actually is to the rest of the fetus's body. So as it comes through here, there is a connection, shown on the previous diagram, a small, short vessel. Pressure in the aorta is still less than pressure in the fetal lungs. And so a little bit of this blood will leave and not go to the lungs. This is kind of like the last exit to get off the, free, the freeway before it becomes a toll road. And the blood will go into the aorta from that structure. It's called the ductus arteriosus in fetal when it's open. Once the baby's born, pressure drops in the lungs because air now is filling the lungs rather than fluid. And that will start to close. It's like the fossa of the foramen ovale becomes the fossa ovalis. And so once it's closed, this is now called the ligamentum arteriosum instead of ductus arteriosus. Okay. So when I ask you to identify these structures, I'll say the, the adult form. Uh, if you give me the fetal form, it's half credit. It's kind of like the papineferm plexus and testicular veins. It's the same thing, but ductus arteriosus means it's open. Foramen ovale means it's open. And the adult form, well, it's really with the baby a week old, uh, starts at that time with the ligamentum arteriosum and fossa ovalis. Okay. So you want to keep those straight. Yes. And it, it doesn't do anything in the adult, it's just kind of there. Yeah. Okay. So after the baby's born, it's just, yeah. it's like our umbilical vein. You okay. still have the umbilical vein mm -hmm. um, going from your umbilicus to the liver, but there's nothing going through it. Okay. So it's collapsed. Okay. But the structure itself doesn't. Okay. okay. All right, so let's stop there um, and go ahead and study the models. I'll bring the sheet parts out. Um, again, if you forgot goggles, we have some under the hood, but you need to be sure to keep them with alcohol. Um, recognize that other people uh, have been using them. And um, I'll get the dissection trays out and so on. Okay? I'm yeah, trying to look at them, so I'm not sure if we have any with the pericardial cavity. So get the models out. Um, you want to review them first, or have them there, that somebody that's not has a clean hand to move around for you. So, you don't right. so um, I'll check back with you. We'll see how we're doing at 9 p.m.
And these are at the interface between two cells known as intercalated disks. I don't know if you remember that term mm -hmm. from last semester. One junction is, is for holding the cells together. And that's the desmosome. So we find the desmosome at the kind of vertical. Remember what a desmosome looked like? It had the inter uh, the plaques in between the cells, and then it had intermediate filaments within the cytoplasm, strengthening that uh, structure. So that's what holds <sighs> the muscle cells together on the vertical tension. On the horizontal, because these aren't as strong, we have gap junctions. And the purpose of the gap junction is not primarily to hold the two cells together, but because of the gap, to allow a passage for primarily ions from one cell to the next. That is how the flow of charged particles passes throughout the cardiac muscle. Because every single, in the skeletal muscle system, every single skeletal muscle cell is innervated, not by an individual nerve, but remember how the axon is spread out to axon terminals? So at least one axon terminal is going to form a synaptic muscular junction with skeletal muscle, but that's not true with cardiac muscle. In fact, the autonomic nervous system just kind of forms a network over the top, and there isn't a membrane-membrane junction. It just kind of releases a neurotransmitter, and it's kind of like the sea urchin's form, just kind of filters out and lands on the receptor, so there's no close coordinated junction. So as the current spreads, from its origin, primarily in the atria near the superior vena cava, it's going to move as a wave from one cell to the next cell through these gap junctions. So that's the, their major purpose. Right? So this sentence down here. We talked about a syncytium, and what the cytotrophoblast cells fuse together. This isn't a true syncytium, but it functions that way as far as the flow of the electrical current is concern. Now, for some reason, students think that the striations, they forget about the striations in um, skeletal muscle, and they think that the bundles of aptin and myosin that you can sometimes see are the striations that are running parallel with the cell. When we talk about striations, we're talking about the short ones that I've drawn here on the board that are perpendicular to the length of the cell. And it's that pattern of light and dark, dark again, due to the presence of the actin myosin overlap. Um, I'm not quite sure how it affects it functionally, but remember what a triad was in skeletal muscle? Two transverse, two wheels. So we had the transverse, well, uh, two terminals is starting. We had the transverse tubules. Remember that? So the imagination of the sarcoplasmic, the um, sarcolemma. Down carrying uh, ex the interstitial fluid down into the cell. And then we had the <coughs> sarcoplasmic reticulum on each side, mm -hmm. dilate. And on, so we have the terminal cisterni on each aspect. So if we did that in cross sections, <coughs> we would have a transverse tubule. And then we would have the terminal cisterni on each side, so it was called a triad. 
terminal cistern. There's sarcoplasmic reticulum on both sides, but only one dilated region, so it's a dyad. Now, what I've drawn on the board are identified as contractile cells. They are the ones that are going to contract and shorten as actin and myosin uh, slide over each other and create the force that makes the chamber smaller, primarily in the ventricles, but it also occurs in the atria. However, there's another cell modified in development from originally contractile cells. They lose much of their actin and myosin and develop a lot of glycogen storage for energy source. And these are called autorhythmic cells. This is the source of the electrical current that's spreading through the gap junction. So these striations, if you see something like this, these are identified as the contractile cells. And that's primarily what well, is what the walls of the heart chambers are made up of. However, we have clusters and bands of autorhythmic cells. Auto meaning self, and rhythmic meaning they have a pattern, a rhythm of generating the electrical current or action potential that is going to spread throughout the heart. So unlike skeletal muscle, these cells, the contractile cells, will contract on their own. Without any instigation by the heart, the contractile cells will depolarize at about the rate of 15 times a minute, which is too slow a heart rate to keep you alive. And the other problem with that is they tend to do it at their own particular rhythm. So this is what fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation is about. There is no controlled governing pattern and the ventricular muscle just quivers as individual contractile cells depolarize and contract. So without a governed pattern, this side over here may contract and then here and then here, whereas to move blood out of the heart, we need to have the contraction starting at the apex and flowing as a wave up towards the openings for the pulmonary trunk and aorta. If it just quivers, there's no pressure created, and there's no flow of the blood. The heart does not require nerves for it to depolarize. Cell the muscle, unless you have uh, abnormal amounts of calcium or uh, sodium around, isn't going to depolarize on its own. Cardiac muscle does. In fact, you could take a heart, you see it's more easily done with a frog heart than with a human heart, um, but it works for both. You could take a frog heart out of the frog, after it's been anesthetized, the frog that is, and place it in a beaker of appropriate electrolytes called frog's ringer solution. And there's still ATP available in the uh, frog heart, so even though it's no longer connected to blood flow from the lungs, there's sufficient energy, it will be for up to 45 minutes or more. <coughs> Certainly there's no nerve connected to it, and so that beating is triggered by the autorhythmic cells. So we're going to look at those cells first, physiologically, and um, then we'll continue with this tomorrow as we talk about the ECG. So up here, there are a cluster of autorhythmic cells at the base of the uh, entrance of the superior cava. Again, we'll go into more detail about these tomorrow. Then another cluster is found here uh, between the uh, valve and the interventricular septum, and those are called the atrioventricular node. And then we have bundles of cells that carry the current down to the apex of the heart. The SA node and its flow through the contractile cells, sends a wave of contraction in this direction. Not really needed because the blood flow under pressure is going to do that anyway, but there is a small amount of contraction just prior to the ventricles contracting. 
Why do we need this structure? If we didn't have this, the yellow band that you see here, and we just allow the wave of contraction to continue, it's going to force the blood towards the apex of the heart where there is no opening. So we have to stop that flow and redirect it starting now at the apex coming in the opposite direction. So to stop that flow, there's a band of dense irregular connective tissue that separates atria from ventricles, including the valve structures, known as the cardiac skeleton. Again, it's not cartilage, it's not bone, it's just dense irregular connective tissue, but it's not conductive. So that blocks the continuing flow of the current through gap junctions. And the purpose of the atrioventricular node and the bundle and the bundle branches is to carry that current then and reintroduce it to the contractile cells starting at the apex. And now then that flow as a wave will move through the cardiac muscle and move the blood in the opposite direction. So let's take a look. That's how we get the ECG pattern, that wave of current. But we'll talk about that in more detail tomorrow. Let's look at the autorhythmic cells. So autorhythmic cells are found wherever you see the yellow here. Well, not this yellow. Right, the SA node, atrioventricular node, bundle, atrioventricular bundle, which you may have heard is the bundle of his, bundle branches, and conduction myofibers or Purkinje fibers. All of those are autorhythmic cells, depolarizing on their own. As we'll see tomorrow, they depolarize at a different rate. So the SA node depolarizes at approximately 100 times a minute. AV node about 40 to 60. These about 40. Um, and then, as I said, individual cells about 12 to 15. Now, none of those are the average heart rate, which is around 72 to 75. So, as we'll see later, the role of the autonomic nervous system is to increase or decrease the normal autorhythmic rate. What does vagus nerve do to heart rate? Slow it down or speed it up? Slow it down. Slow it down. And that's, in effect, remember the rest and digest role of parasympathetic? So, your slower heart rate is the effect of parasympathetic on the sinoatrial node. If you're scared or you're exercising or you need a higher heart rate, then the sympathetic nervous system will come in and create this at a faster rate. Fastest I've tagged my heart was I was climbing at about 10,000 feet. My husband and I were out camping, and my heart rate was, I finally told him when we reached the summit I needed to sit down and rest. It was 210 beats a minute. They were scared of a ton, and I said, I'm feeling fine. I just think I should rest and let my heart rate come down. Um, but that's the role of autonomic. So it doesn't start it, all right? It modulates it. So first we need to establish how this occurs, and then we can uh, look at the autonomic nervous system to see how its modulation occurs. Can I erase this image here? So first of all, we're going to do a review from the um, polarization membrane potentials from last semester. Okay. If this is sufficient for your understanding um, over the weekend, if not tonight, you might want to go back to uh, the chapter on membrane potentials in your textbook and review those concepts. All right. So what, what do we mean by membrane potential? <coughs> what types of cells demonstrate a membrane potential? Nerve cells. Nerve cells and muscle cells. muscle cells. Okay? So when we talk about a resting membrane potential, if you recall, we're talking about the difference in positive and negative charges just on either side of the cell membrane. So for nerve and muscle, there are more positive charges outside the cell 
Now we're not talking about completely around the cell, all right, but just at the membrane. And fewer positive or more negative charges just inside the cell at the membrane. And that's what we mean by a resting membrane potential. There are three factors that create this resting membrane potential. Anybody remember what they are? Three factors of what? All right, so inside the cell, there are intracellular proteins which have a net negative charge. Pardon? The pumps, yes. Uh -huh. Proteins are too large to leave the membrane, so these negative charges are trapped within the cell. Uh, the wall mentioned the pump. Which pump are we talking about? So the sodium, the calcium pump, how does that create a net negative charge? It swaps out uh, sodium. Or so three sodium ions out for every two potassium ions in, and therefore there's a net loss leak of positive channels and leak channels. So we have... more potassium leak channels, fewer sodium leak channels. And where is, um, where these ions have their higher concentration? Sodium's inside, or sodium outside the cell. Sodium outside the cell. Potassium in. Potassium inside. So if we have more <coughs> potassium, that means we're going to have more potassium leaving. Mm -hmm. Then we have sodium mm -hmm. leaking in. So again, a greater loss of positive charges than a gain of positive charges. And so all these three are the three major factors leading to this relationship of more positive, fewer positive, or more negative inside the cell. So that gives us our resting membrane potential. So if we look at this graph, bring back memories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> bad ones, bad, bad, bad ones. Oh, come on. So zero means there would be no difference if we were to put an electrode inside the cell and an electrode outside the cell. If it's at zero, same number of positive and negative ions are found inside and outside just again at the rest at the membrane level. And in nerve cells, we had our resting membrane potential at about minus 70, mm -hmm. okay? In cardiac muscle, it's around minus 40 to minus 50. Okay, it's a little bit higher. So the minus in front means the inside of the cell is more negative in relationship to the outside of the cell. So hence, our resting membrane potential is demonstrated as a line, flat line, because it doesn't change when we're talking about our nerve. So let's go back to what we learned about nerves. When we open up a channel with a ligand, with a chemical, all right, or mechanical stimulation, and we allow positive ions into the cell, what's going to happen to the line? We're going to deflect up or down? Up. up. Because we're letting positive ions into the cell, so it's going to become more positive, similar to what's outside the cell. So we call that rise upward depolarization. Coming back? All right, now if we were to open up channels and let potassium out, we're losing positive ions. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing by letting chloride ions in, which were negative. So if we lose positive or we gain negative, here if we lose positive or we gain negative, then this is hyperpolarization if we go below, or if we're already up here, Repolarization. 
Question? All right, so resting membrane potential. Now, if we had, could I raise this side of the So this is our resting membrane potential. If we opened up the channel, say with acetylcholine, opened up the sodium ion channel with acetylcholine, and nothing else happened, what do we call this? What kind of potential? A graded potential, right? So graded potential can be different strengths. It can be either positive, or we can have a graded potential that is negative. Okay? Remember EPSPs and IPSPs? Sorry, We're not going to get into that with the heart, but either make that inside of the heart more negative or the inside of the muscle under more negative or more positive. All right, so what kind of um, with greater potential, these types of channels were ligand-gated channels? All right, so if we had a lot of acetylcholine, then we would open up a lot of positive ion channels. If we only had a little bit of acetylcholine, then we just opened up a few. And so we would have a different strength of our greater potential. <coughs> so if we did open up, if we opened up just a few, we opened up a lot. So that's what we mean by greater potential. It's dependent on the number of channels that were opened. So these would be opened by ligand or chemical gated channels. Acetylcholine, norepinephrine, serotonin, whatever we're talking about. What was another channel that could affect this? Nicotinic. Pardon? Nicotinic. Well, that's a mechanical? ligand. Mechanical. Nicotinic. Not voltage. Mechanical. Mechanical. And as we're going to see with the heart, leak channels, which are open all the time. But some cells modulate them more than others. So all of those would create rated potential. Then we had another potential. If a graded potential became strong enough, it would reach the threshold, the minimum current required to open voltage-gated channels. So what did we call this specific graded potential? Threshold. Threshold. And then that was the action potential and it was always specifically associated with what type of channel? The voltage. That's why we had the threshold, because that was the specific voltage. Okay, that's about an hour's lecture in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So again, if that doesn't make sense, go back and reread the uh, section in the, in the nervous system or in the earlier chapter on membranes about these different channels. So we have a graded potential here. These are our autorhythmic cells again. There is a threshold potential, an action potential. Okay. So these are affected by leak channels and ligand-gated channels. These are voltage-gated channels. 
Now these are only autorhythmic cells. When we get to contractile cells, we have an action, we have a potential that looks like this. And I drew this very briefly last semester when we were looking at skeletal muscle. We were talking about absolute uh, and refractory period and the hearts and abilities or lack of going into tetanus. However, you'll notice that this action potential for a contractile cell starts from a resting membrane potential and then goes instantly into an action potential. There's no early graded potential. That's because the cardiac contractile cell is getting a flow of positive ions via the gap junction. And that's at a current strong enough to open these voltage-gated channels. Right. So how do we get that particular action potential? And this is a real basic diagram that illustrates this concept. May I erase the board? Back. Again, this is all review from last semester. So what do you see is absent from this diagram? Of all the things that I drew on the board, which I've just erased. What is absent? What type of potential is absent? Um, no, threshold is there. Graded potential is there. The, oh, I forget the name, it's after the repolarization. No, that's there. Okay, here is a nerve. And then it receives the current from the cell body, fires, it could either be a muscle too. Oh, then as it goes back. down, then as it goes down the axon channel, we don't really need a greater potential. Mm. Oh yeah. So it doesn't go back. There you go. There is no resting membrane potential. Does that mean the heart doesn't rest? Nope. Okay. When you're at rest, most of the time the heart is at rest. All right, so there's a greater period of rest between <laughs> action potentials for the, or for the heart. So, at least for the cardiac contractile cells, for the autorhythmic cells, they don't rest. The contractile cells do. But uh, the autorhythmic cells do not. The heart itself will rest, okay? But the autorhythmic cells are always changing. They don't have a resting membrane potential. The contractile cells will. Because while this is going on, there is no action potential. So there is no current going to the contractile cells to contract. So we will see, um, let me just kind of diagram that briefly, even though we're not talking about contractile cells yet. Here is a contractile cell action potential. Oh, wow. Here is the autorhythmic cell. So when the autorhythmic cell fires, that creates sufficient current to travel through the gap junctions to reach the contractile cells and cause them to fire. While that is occurring and there is a rest between the next trigger to contract, the autorhythmic cells are depolarizing on their way to their threshold potential. So the autorhythmic cells are never at a resting potential. As soon as they recover from their action potential, they immediately are depolarizing to reach the next threshold. So if the, let's say that the sympathetic nervous system, um, well, let's start with the parasympathetic nervous system. This would be without nerve control. The heart would be at, say, 100 beats a minute. The SA node is firing 100 times a minute. How would this change 
if I decrease the heart rate to 70. So this is going to change. It's going to take a lot longer to reach threshold. Hence, I have fewer action potentials in the autorhythmic cells per minute. Hence, I have fewer action potentials in my contractile cells. Now, sympathetic nervous system is increasing heart rate to 120 beats per minute. What's going to be different? It's going to shorten it. It's going to take less time to reach threshold potential. So now let's look at what's happening at the autorhythmic cells. Because each of these action potentials is going to result in an action potential of the contractile cells. So this is the important part of the control system here. Negative 40, but at negative 30, those channels don't open. 
if it gets low enough, so down to negative 40 to negative 50 in there, then these funny channels open for both sodium and potassium, all right? Sodium coming in, potassium leaving, but sodium coming in at a faster rate. The other factor that opens them is cyclic AMT. So norepinephrine, when it binds to, and we'll look at this when we look at nervous control, when norepinephrine binds to its receptor, it activates adenylate cyclic, cyclase, which forms cyclic AMP from ATP. Norepinephrine isn't binding to these channels. That's why I said it's an internal. Norepinephrine isn't binding to these particular channels, but to receptors on the cell membrane. And as a result, there's an increase in cyclic AMP, and the cyclic AMP binds to the channels. That's why I said it's an internal ligand. And it raises the negative charge required for that channel to open. So let's say that normally this is going to open at minus 50. With cyclic AMP, it's going to open here instead. So it doesn't have to become quite as negative before the channels open. So it doesn't have to wait as long for that to happen. Does that make sense? So remember, minus 50 is more negative than minus 40. And so it's going to open more soon, more, more quickly. So sympathetic nervous system raises cyclic AMP levels. And parasympathetic changes the potassium channels. But we're going to review this when we get to autonomic control. Right now, we're just looking at what's happening. All right, there's also calcium channels that allow positive ions in that we'll uh, look at more with the parasympathetic component. Then we reach the threshold. So let's take a look at this first. Oh, this is confusing because of the lines, okay? So that's why I wrote the verbal descriptions. So you're not spending your time trying to figure out the diagram. So we have sodium potassium pumps. That's number one over here. Pumping sodium, potassium in, and sodium out. All right. We have the leak sodium, allowing sodium to leak into the cell. And then we have the voltage-gated potassium, which we're open for our repolarization. So these are voltage. So let's write them here. We have a leak sodium, allowing sodium ions in. We have sodium potassium pumps, which are taking out sodium. And here we have voltage-gated potassium, allowing potassium to leak. Those slowly close as we recover. All right. So these are open up here, closing down here. As they close, they allow more of an effect of the leaky sodium to shift the balance of where the positive ions are moving. And then we have the funny current channels. All right. So these are the uh, funny current channels here. And they are going to allow, again, positive ions, sodium ions in, and a little bit of potassium out. But the net effect is sodium in. So the net effect of all of this is a gradual increase in the number of positive ions inside the cell. So as we get a little bit more positive, voltage-gated calcium channels open. So voltage-gated calcium channels are going to open about here. because of the rising positive charges inside the cell. So they're going to open just slightly before we reach threshold. When we get to threshold, we have fast-acting voltage-gated channels for calcium open. 
And this depolarization, which in our nerve and skeletal muscle cells was due to sodium voltage gated, is unique because in our autorhythmic cells, that's due to calcium. Okay? So these are called fast calcium channels. That results in our spike in depolarization. Then we reach the, so we're in action potential. We reach the top of action potential. That calcium binds to potassium channels and opens them, along with the current causing them to open. And therefore, we go into repolarization due to voltage-gated potassium channels. And so we're in repolarization. So that part is the same as we saw with skeletal muscle and with nerve cells. So to recapture this, we have a gradual increase of positive ions in the cell due to leaky sodium channels, all right, that are more numerous than our leaky potassium, due to the closure of our voltage-gated potassium, and due to these funny channels that allow both potassium and sodium to cross, but primarily sodium coming in. So the overall effect is an increase in the positive number of ions inside the cell. We reach threshold. Our fast-acting calcium channels are going to allow a ton of calcium into the, well not literally, but a lot of calcium to rapidly enter the cell and that's what allows us to reach the peak of our action potential. All right. So again, this is the action potential. all of this, and the voltage-gated potassium channel will open because of that peak of the current, also because calcium that's inside is bound to the potassium channel and causing them to open as well. So now as the calcium gets pumped out, the potassium voltage-gated channels are going to close, and along with the fact that the overall current is dropping, the number of positive ions are dropping, and that's going to continue to cause the voltage-gated channels to close. And then eventually we reach hyperpolarization. And this hyperpolarization voltage causes the funny channels to open. And we start the process all over again. So for our autorhythmic cells, they are constantly in flux. They're either in the graded potential of depolarization or they're in an action potential. And where we change the rate of the heart is affecting the graded portion. Okay. This is not going to, we don't change the amount of time it takes for the action potential to occur. It's either increasing the time it takes for positive ions to enter the heart, the autorhythmic cells, or decreasing the time either by opening more voltage-gated, ligand-gated, funny current channels, or in the case of acetylcholine, closing our potassium channels. Rather, not closing, opening the potassium channels. If we open the potassium channels and we're losing positive ions, it's going to take longer for the heart to reach threshold. So if looking at the diagrams, I don't test you on these diagrams, by the way. So if that makes it more confusing, then just read the words. Okay? That's why I kind of wrote out a description of there along with that. Sometimes trying to understand the other part can be confusing. So remember, norepinephrine binds to receptors in the autorhythmic cells. And our uh, sympathetic receptors are alpha or beta. In the case of this, they're beta. And we have beta 1 and beta 2. Beta 1 are the excitatory receptors. So the sympathetic nervous system has an excitatory effect on the heart, a relaxing effect in the lungs, so relaxing the airways, 
So it's beta 1 in the heart, beta 2 in the lungs. We want our, our, our um, airways to dilate. So norepinephrine binds to beta 1 receptors. The alpha subunit activates the membrane enzyme adenylate cyclase, just like we covered in the first week of the semester. Adenylate cyclase converts ATP to cyclic AMP. This is just phosphodiesterase abbreviation up here. Cyclic AMP over here is binding to the funny channel and causing it to open sooner than it normally would. Okay? That was the effect that I wrote down here of the internal ligand being cyclic AMP. So the funny channels will open because of the drop in number of positive ions, that's their voltage gated effect, and they will open because of cyclic AMP. And the effect of norepinephrine is to provide more cyclic AMP so these channels open earlier. Does that make sense on the two aspects of that? So if they open earlier and there's more channels open, the inside of the cell is going to become positive at a steeper rate, and we're going to reach thresholds earlier. Therefore, we're going to have more action potentials per minute, and contractile cells will beat more often per minute. We have an action potential in our autorhythmic cells, um, you know, 110 times a minute, then the heart's going to beat 110 times a minute. So there's a direct um, correlation there. All right, so I suppose the reason that phosphodiesterase is up in the diagram is one of the roles of caffeine. Is it blocks phosphodiesterase? So even more cyclic AMP is within the cell, and therefore more of it's able to affect the funny current channels and increases heart rate, right? More so than just with the norepinephrine. Does this make sense? you have enough stuff behind you to understand the background? So here's just a diagram, back to norepinephrine. All right, forming cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP binding directly to the funny channel. It's not showing that here, but it does bind directly to the funny channel. Okay, and also calcium channels are going to be open. When we look at the contractile cells, norepinephrine also binds to contractile cells, which don't have funny channels, but they do have calcium channels. This becomes important in the contractile cells. What does calcium do when we have contractile cells, when we have muscle cells? Oh, binds calcium binds to not calmodulin in the cardiac muscle cells, the smooth muscle, but to uh, troponin. And it opens. Remember, in skeletal muscle, troponin caps tropomycin mm -hmm. in between because we're, it takes time to fill up the heart. So at first, we're not going to have as much blood flow returning to the heart. And so let's say there's 135 mils of blood in the ventricle. A normal contraction pumps out half of that about 70, so we still have 70 left. A faster heart rate is going to move it out more faster, but a stronger heart is going to pump out to the 70, it could pump out 100 mils. So we're not just getting more blood out faster, but we're getting more blood per stroke volume, all right, more blood per contraction. So how does the parasympathetic slow the heart down? Parasympathetic is going to affect the muscarinic type receptors, because this is the terminal end. Remember, nicotinic are just between pre and post. So these are postganglionic fibers. What is the nerve? What parasympathetic nerve is going to have postganglionic fibers in the heart? Vagus. Vagus. All right. So vagus nerves, postganglionic fibers are already in the cell, in the heart muscle binds to muscarinic receptors, that's true for any postganglionic component. So there's going to be a inhibit inhibition of adenylate cyclase. So we're going to have fewer cyclic AMP, all right? Um, and so the funny 
channels aren't going to open as much, less calcium. And then the other, not the alpha subunit, but the beta and gamma subunits, open potassium channels. That's the key factor here. Because with potassium coming into the cell, it's going to counteract the sodium coming in, sorry, with the potassium uh, leaving the cell, it's going to counteract the sodium coming in, and so it's going to take a longer time before enough positive ions allow the cell to reach threshold. So one takes shorter, one takes longer, one increases heart rate, the other decreases heart rate. So we'll, we'll keep reviewing this, and I actually have a whole bunch of review questions to go through with you when we're done, um, just before our exam on this that we'll review. All right, conduction cells are or, um, going to carry. They're modified as well. They're going to carry this current without contracting. Down, remember that previous image that I showed you where the yellow fibers were? So these are all the conduction cells carrying the current to the contractile cells. All right, so we'll look at that pathway in more detail tomorrow. So we go through the conduction cells and then we get to, I can put this right there, we get to the contractile cells. So in the contractile cells, we have these three major components. I'll go over them again tomorrow. We have the typical sodium-potassium pump. We have calcium pumps and sodium and calcium transporters. So why is it so important that we be able to move calcium ions? They're positive, but also they're going to result in additional binding sites. And we don't want them remaining. Remember when we talked about tetany with skeletal muscle? And if we didn't allow the cell to relax before we stimulated it again, the reason we had a stronger stimulus when we saw the trap getting into tetany was because we still had so potassium ion, sorry, we still had calcium ions in the cell. Remember this pattern? And we didn't allow the cell to relax completely. And when we stimulated again with the same strength, we got a stronger contraction because there were still calcium ions in the cytoplasm. And there was, that meant more every time we created more calcium, we added the number of actin binding sites, which increased myosin and actin binding, which increased contractile force. So we don't want to do that with the heart. We don't want to go into tetany with the heart. So in addition to having a longer refractory period, we have additional mechanisms for getting calcium out of the cytoplasm. Okay. So that's why those are important. So in the cardiac contractile muscle cells, we have similar uh, components. We have voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium, and again, voltage-gated calcium. Now, in the autorhythmic cells, voltage-gated calcium channels were in our depolarization. Okay, so the up-loop, the depolarization of our action potential, and these were the fast voltage-gated calcium channels. All right. In contractile cells, our voltage-gated channels are going to be in the repolarization component. And they are slow-acting. So listen for that as we go through the contractile cells. And I'll review this with you again tomorrow, okay? That's a whole bunch. Now we're hitting physiology that's not quite as easy as learning the parts of the heart. But fortunately, it at least is a based on material that you learned already. Now, may I raise the board? <laughs>
You guys have that? By the way, for those of you that haven't had me before, um, and those of you that have, as a reminder, I want you to be able to relate what's happening with the membrane potential to what types of channels are open. So resting membrane potential in the contractile cells or the greater potential that you see here is due to what channels? Our depolarization here, or our fast acting calcium. Our repolarization is voltage gated potassium. Our depolarization here are the sodium potassium pump, the leaky channels, and the funny current channels. So practice diagramming those and visualizing what channels are opening with. We'll start off with that tomorrow at the beginning of lecture, kind of do the review of that. So here's a diagram of contractile cells. Typically, when you're reading something and it talks about cardiac muscle cells, unless they specifically refer to autoimmune, they're going to be talking about contractile cells. Okay? These do have a distinctive resting membrane potential because they're not contracting all the time. So you should recognize this as a pattern of contractile cells. You should recognize this as a pattern of autorhythmic cells. Okay. And then we're going to contrast it with skeletal muscle. And skeletal muscle cells look like that. So, we have a sharp peak, but very similar to our nerve cells. So again, in our contractile cells, this is our resting membrane potential. Do the same three reasons that I put up on the board already. The skeletal muscle, the negative charge proteins inside the cell. Sodium potassium pumps, pumping out more sodium than it's allowing potassium back in. And the fact that there's more leak channels for potassium than there are leak channels open for sodium. So that creates a resting membrane potential. Then the autorhythmic cells reach an action potential. Fast voltage gated channels open for sodium for calcium. And a flood of positive ions enter the cell and pass via the gap junctions into the surrounding contractile cells. So we're talking about all of these cells right here that are contractile cells. So those positive ions, which are primarily calcium, are going to come into that cell because remember electrical current is a flow of charged particles. And as they reach the gap junctions and enter the cell, they're going to cause this spike. Right? So the stimulus here is due to positive ions entering via gap junctions. Now, at first, surrounding the autorhythmic cells, those positive ions are going to be calcium. But for successive downstream contractile cells, it's going to be sodium because this is a sodium voltage gated channel here. Right? So that's why I didn't indicate sodium or calcium here because it's only calcium for the ones in the immediate vicinity. 
So this part of the, this whole thing is the action potential, by the way. All right, so all of this is action potential. And what type of channels? Great, well, just general. Ligand or voltage gated? Voltage gated. So no matter where the action potential is, in the autorhythmic cell or the contractile cell, it's going to be created by the opening and closing of voltage-gated channels. So in our autorhythmic cell, this voltage-gated channel is a calcium voltage-gated channel. In our skeletal muscle, sodium. In our contractile cell, sodium. period and our relative refractory period. Mm -hmm. 
during the absolute refractory period, no matter how strong a stimulus, we could never increase or open the channels again. All right? Relative, we could, but it was had to be really strong. So by creating this plateau, the refractory period for the cardiac contractile cell is extended 100 times longer than in skeletal muscle. The entire action potential for skeletal muscle takes two to three milliseconds. In cardiac muscle, it's 200 to 300 milliseconds. It lasts almost as long as the whole contraction. So the end result of this Here's the absolute refractory period and the relative refractory period. All right. Here's the um, contraction. This is showing contraction in skeletal muscle. So notice how the refractory period ends before the contraction phase, so we can get the skeletal muscle to contract again when it hasn't yet relaxed. That's how we get tetany. Okay. Whereas in cardiac muscle, here's the action potential. Notice that. The contractual period, the refractory period, lasts almost as long as the contraction. So this prevents the cardiac muscle from going into tech, which is a good thing because it fastens up blood flow stops. We're no longer circulating blood flow through the heart. So a prolonged refractory period inhibits or actually prevents tetany from occurring. I think I've covered enough there to satisfy you for the night. Um, yeah. So go back to what you know. Bad night for four hours. <laughs> the channels and membranes are fuzzy. Don't try to go over this stuff. If you've gone back over and review the membrane channels and potentials that you covered last semester. Once you've done that, this will take a third or a quarter of a time to understand or go over if you understand the material from that semester. We'll start and go over this again tomorrow. Okay? But take some time this evening if you're still awake. So at least read through that part of the chapter and look at the PowerPoints again. So the second time you hear it tomorrow, uh, more of it will make sense.